Assalamu alaikum and welcome to another episode of the Dr. Will Show, where I interview educators and entrepreneurs on leveling up. Each episode, I zoom in someone who's dope, and we just sit back and have a conversation on what it means to live your best life. Now, if this is your first time checking out the podcast, this is the Mobile University for Entrepreneurs, and I'm your host, Dr. Will. People, mm-mm. today's guest. Dr. Key Hallman. Hey, people, look, from Mississippi, from the good old Tougaloo, Eagle Queen, we love thee, which they made us all learn that song uh, <laughs> at Tougaloo College, doing mission. Uh, man, okay, I, I, just so many memories, but we had a little chance to talk about Tougaloo or whatever before the show, but I wanted to have her on because she is doing some amazing things. I mean, the business that she created, building community, building other Black entrepreneurs up and bringing the the talk, the real understanding of what entrepreneurship means for Black people, which I talk about all the time on Twitter. Because for me, economic empowerment means liberation, right? Mm-hmm. I, you know, I, I'm not into marching. I'm into making money, you know what I'm saying? So uh, I wanted to have her on and to talk about what she's doing, how she found herself and entrepreneurship and some other things. So for those who be listening on Apple Podcasts, Google Podcasts, iHeartRadio, Simplecast, Stitcher, Spotify, and Audible, will you please introduce yourself, Dr. Key? Yes, Dr. Will. Uh, Before I do this introduction, thank you so much for having me on. Thank you for creating this space for people like me and others who are big dreamers, big innovators, and and getting it done. Um, My fellow Tougaloo family, It's an honor to be here. I am Dr. Lakeisha Hallman, Dr. Key, founder and CEO of The Village Market. I've also launched The Village Retail and have an awesome opportunity to create a nonprofit organization, Our Village United. And so by way of introduction, before all those things, I am a proud Mississippian living living and growing in Atlanta. I'm a a very proud first-generation graduate of D. Tougaloo College. Uh, I am a proud, 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 proud person from Baseville, Mississippi, where the cotton literally grows hot. And I had the honor, the distinct honor before launching the Village Market, being a teacher in the Mississippi Delta. Wow, that is all right, people. Woo. Hope we don't go down memory lane too much today, people, but this is, I'm, I, I'm, I'm so excited. So I'm always curious as to how people got to where they are. What did you think you would be doing when you were growing up and how did you find yourself at the intersection of entrepreneurship and education? Oh, thank you. Thank you for that question. You know, when I think about the, the, the young version of me, um, believe it or not, Dr. Will, I was doing a lot in my mind, what I'm doing today. I always wanted to write. Uh, I always wanted to be a public speaker. Uh, I didn't, young, I didn't know the word entrepreneur, but I knew that I wanted to create some type of business. And at the same time, I wanted to be an educator. And so when I look at my journals when I was in third grade or if my, and my grandmothers who love to tell the same stories a million times over and say, you know, you've been saying these things since you, you were little and we didn't understand all the stuff that you said you wanted to do. So the younger version of me, um, really doing exactly what I am doing now. It just, it's in a realized way. Mm. And it's interesting because I'm going to assume you had, you had the same upbringing I did, but you know, a lot of times the black folks, you know, they tell you to get that a college education, get that lesson and go get you a good job with some benefits. And what we normally see, okay is we see educators, we see doctors, we see lawyers, we see nurses and social workers and counselors. We normally don't, you know, people come up and say, do you have a dream to build build a business? (laughs) And we don't hear people talk about the tech space and which you've created online entities. Um, Before we get into what the village market is, will you please, I guess, speak to the importance of why entrepreneurship is so important uh, for Black people and, and so important for us to start 
talking to our young people, uh, particularly at the K through 12 level, as they're going through school about, you know, it's cool. I mean, nothing wrong with those professions. Hey, that's what I do for a living. But understanding that there is uh, power in entrepreneurship and, and not only that, but a way for you to fulfill and leverage your strengths and, and those creative passions that you have. Absolutely. And, and I will say, you know, before I answer why entrepreneurship is so important, you know, I think the pathway that our parents set before us, our grandparents set before us was the pathway that they felt was safe. Um, it was their idea of what it meant to be successful. And for black folks, especially those who grow up in any sense of poverty or in a, any rural area, our families just want us to be able to outgrow the factories. Um, my, my mother and father, you know, labored and my father still do to this day, you know, labor in factories. And so their aspirations for them when they were growing up, it's like, hey, I want to be able to get this job that pays this amount. And for my sister and I, and there's four of us total, the aspiration was we didn't go to college. We want y'all to go to college. And what they, what they could infer by way of things they would see on television or what, it, what Black success looked like, it was under those umbrellas in which you, in which you named. Um, and so entrepreneurship wasn't a thing that was talked about because what is celebrated, especially during that time in the 90s, what was celebrated is really what we got to see on television, the, the, the Claire and Heathcliff being mm -hmm. doctors, uh, being, do uh, being doctors, being attorneys, being dentists. Um, and so on, and also being teachers. And so I understand when you are growing up and your parents can only offer you the, that, that thing that they believe is gonna keep you the safest, um, that success and what that looks like. Um, but now every generation is supposed to birth something new, right? So we're excited to celebrate uh, you know, the doctors of the world the attorneys of the world and all these other entities, but there's a new narrative that we can add to that. Other spaces that we need to show up fully in black excellence is by our own creation of our own things and that's entrepreneurship. And this is not a new concept. Black people have been entrepreneurs, it literally from whoever was the person that made your freeze cups, had an entrepreneur um, literally vein inside of her. The person that was making the choir robes, the person that gave you the ride was the first Uber. When it, so we see these things in our communities, when you see them in the country, we've seen this, but it's never been celebrated the same way as an attorney or a doctor or a teacher. So our job, you know, Dr. Will and other entrepreneurs out there is to say on top of all these things, because we need black people in all spaces, not just entrepreneurship, but it's in this entrepreneur space, this is what this looks like. This is how you can build. This is how you can have economic mobility. This is how you can build generational wealth through the creation of your own entity. And I think the more we talk about it, the more we humanize what entrepreneurship is and how vast it can be. That no doubt. And even with, ed with educators, with my show is geared towards, it's all about educators creating multiple streams of income and taking those experiences in the classroom what they know to create those economic opportunities outside of the job. Because, you know, I didn't get into this, 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 this job, this career, because, you know, I wanted a Bugatti, but I didn't do it because I wanted to live off baloney either. Right. And, and though I'm not at the baloney stage, uh, <laughs> because I have some years and a few degrees, but my earning potential is capped, mm. right? You can't go to the school district and say, you know, by the way, you see that evaluation you gave me? Uh, I'm going to need another 5000 on top of that. Doesn't work that way. Uh, so to create that, so you do not be holding to them for your, your economic prosperity, I think, you know, that's one of the things that I push on the show. So you created the Village Market, which is really dope. I, the website is awesome, people. Ooh, go to that website. All that's going to be in the show notes. You can check that out. I do that. I've been seeing you doing all these interviews on YouTube, man, you everywhere. Uh, tell us about the village market and what was the story behind you actually creating the company? I tell folks that, you know, the village market was Wakanda before the movie came out, uh, Black Panther. And so I have a vision and I keep this vision in my mind of what it, a utopian society would be for Black folk. 
And what does black prosperity look and feel like? What does it look like to be in a space where uh, the transaction of black gifts meet the transaction of black dollars and beyond black dollars? That that circulation is how we began to reimagine what community is and lift a legacy up. And so all of this stuff that plays in my mind and has played in my mind for years is the reason why I created the Village Market. Um, I had a, you know, a very interesting pathway here in the city of Atlanta. The majority of my friends were entrepreneurs. And so to hear them talk about their, their dreams and their aspirations, even with limited beliefs in what they could be, really troubled me. Because a good friend of mine is a, you know, an incredible DJ, but a couple of years ago, she really thought the only way she could DJ was parties on the side. And I hear something like that, Dr. Will, and say, well, do you want to be a DJ as your full-time career? And she said, yeah. And I was like, well, let's go get it. Because I think the thing about why the village market is so important is that what you may be doing on the side today eventually is going to be full-time if you put in a sweat equity, operate in excellence, and really lean into your village the way that you're supposed to. And that's why I created this nighttime marketplace for entrepreneurs to come out and showcase their gifts and showcase their wares and sell their products and talk about their services. Because to me, if you present a village before the community, there is no excuse anymore of like, I don't know how to buy black or support black or the single narrative of what it means to be black, that we only do one thing and we only do that one thing well. And so the village market, I want to demystify that whole space. I wanted that spaces that we've been erased um, before a couple of years ago in tech, the way that we've been erased in commercial real estate, the way that we've been erased in content creators and marketing, I wanted to make sure the village market was able to uplift all of that. And so when people will walk into my village market experiences, I've, I've experienced folks just come to tears. Because if you can imagine a hundred entrepreneurs from across the country, not just in Atlanta, all convening in one space, looking their best, smelling amazing, the music is good, the food is soulful, people are joyous. And the only thing that you have to do is walk into that space and come with the mind that this is ours. That's the village market uh, was really created off, off that foundation of what it means to be unapologetically black and excellent in our gifts. Mm. Take a moment with that one. Okay. <laughs> Okay, so <laughs> what you said was just really, wow, it was just really dope. And I love that you are dedicated to Black entrepreneurship and building wealth and Black excellence. When you had this idea of this is once what you wanted to do, how did you put this together, being that you were an educator before? Yes. Uh, and I think the reason why I was able to put this together is because I was an educator before. And so building a business is no different than building your curriculum or building your syllabi, right? And, and having is no different than having your department chair and then having your, 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 your principal and having a superintendent. Building a business is literally operates like education, that there has to be a foundation of what you're building. And it has to be clear what everybody's responsibilities are in order to get the impact in the end. And so when I had this concept of the village market, I was actually finishing my doctorate. It wasn't time because I couldn't give to it. And I literally wrote down the day that I had the, the, the vision of the village market. I knew, I, Dr. Will, without any doubt, when I got the vision for it, I knew it was exactly what I was supposed to do. And I never had a vision of creating a village before. And so when I saw it, I had to table it though, because I knew I needed to finish my doctorate in order to, to do this well, because I was working full time, working on my doctorate, and then now I got this vision. And so when it was time to start building the village market was uh, December, 2015. I didn't necessarily create a, a business plan. I created my vision plan around it. And I began to literally see like, I wanna do these classes for entrepreneurs because I think one of the mistakes of those who decide to create businesses that's more service-based, that's more social impact, is that you build things and you haven't listened to the people who, that, who you say you're building it for. 
And so I spent months meeting with entrepreneurs and learning about different business pathways, learning about the things that has been a struggle for them, not failure, but a struggle space. Um, and then also learning from entre entrepreneurs who've accelerated. I would get these people in a room and what I'm doing at night is downloading what I learned. And as I would download what I was learning, I was putting another step on my vision plan. And so after the third month of meeting with entrepreneurs and convening uh, accelerated entrepreneurs in the same space, I told these entrepreneurs, there's over 100, 100 of them in my class. I said, so, hey, we've done these classes. You've been connected to some other dope people. And there's a time and a place that action had, you have to be able to put in action what you've learned. And I asked them to raise your hand if I created an opportunity for entrepreneurs, for people to come out and buy from you, are you ready? And well, over 80% of the room, you know, raised their hand and said they was ready, but they didn't know though, within a month, I will be actualizing this because I kept it quiet from everybody that this is what I will be doing. Um, they didn't know that these classes were going to turn into a marketplace. Um, so then that night I sent my email out and I said, you ready? That's what you said. And, you know, April 23rd is go time. And I need you to show up, be prepared. And that's how I was able to build, build a village. And I don't think every business model works that way. But how I work is making sure that I have a very clear understanding of who my target audience is, what is my mission, what are the KPIs, and what is the blueprint, our curriculum, to get us to being able to actualize something and to make it real? Mm. Wow. Okay, okay. So you, so this all, oh, let's go back. Like when you launch this and you're looking at it, you're, and you're just sitting back and you're like, wow. You're looking at everything and it's, it's all beautiful and love. What did you take? from that moment, the first one you launched that told you that you were heading in the right direction? The, what I took, and I can still you know, see the night at the DeFore Center on the Upper West Side of, of Atlanta. What I took from that moment, I never hosted an event to that size before. I'd never been a vendor. Um, all the things that I learned to produce that first event, all of it, all of it was new to me. But as people walked in and really as the vendors loaded in, I was downloading their experience. Like I see them coming in, like what could have been better? Uh, because to me, the customer service first is those people who signed up to be vendors for the market. So I would download, like I like this, but I didn't like that. Because I tell folks, I always wanna have that level of excellence when we think about places like Chick-fil-A. Um, like how do you, you don't cut any corners with people who've invested in your company. Um, so I downloaded that. And then next, when it was time for the doors to open, you know, Dr. Will, I still remember standing in the middle of the, the, the four center and watching people come in and having an out of body experience. Like, I cannot believe this thing that I thought of five months ago that I put to, I had to table and I could see all the classes that I met with entrepreneurs, that this village was actually being built. That people were coming out at six o'clock on a Friday night to buy a ticket to come and buy from black businesses. And they're bringing their kids and they're bringing their cousins. And these entrepreneurs were also ready. It was such an out of body moment for me that I, I knew for sure as the small corrections that I wanted to make, it was no question in my mind that this was just the beginning of something that was going to change my life um, and the entrepreneurs that I served. And so I remember getting in a car and I cried about it because I was like, I cannot believe this just happened. Um, in, in the way that all the things that I aspired to do took place and folks left happy and people left full and I hit the ground running within two days to make it better. Because another gear with entrepreneurship, you sit in the moment, you enjoy that moment, but you be prepared for making the next even better than what, what you just experienced. And so I, from that night, two days later is when I actually built my first business plan 
for, for the village market and that five-year trajectory of where we would be. So as a social enterprise, how are you using entrepreneurship to engage and empower Black people? Entrepreneurship, uh, the way that we do it with the, with the village, um, and not just the way that we give back, but the way that we have raised consciousness and what we're deserving of is through those marketplaces. Um, and through the trainings, we have an incredible incubator called Elevate. And Elevate is created holistic in, in design that we spend a great deal, you know, with the focusing on business acumen, having that curriculum in place. But in the other end of that, we talk about something that was very taboo with entrepreneurship before, and that is our mental health. I just wrote a piece, you know, for Essence Magazine about one of my very rough days in entrepreneurship. Um, I don't know if I had anxiety before launching a business, but I have it now. And I've been able to identify that that is something that was birthed through entrepreneurship, but at the same time, other entrepreneurs have to feel the same thing. And so we've undertaken a wellness component in, in the village market and with OBU and with the village retail. And that has been, you know, incredible. So we have, you know, partnerships in place with Therapy for Black Girls. Uh, Dr. Joy and I have been able to put together events where we're bringing out over 100 business owners and pairing and Dr. Ayana Abrams and, and I are pairing these entrepreneurs with a mental health practitioner. And we spend a moment talking about business. And then we spend a moment talking about why, why are our limited thoughts on why we think we can only be where we are today and how we're dealing with burnout and how we're dealing with the growth, the success of growth. And so all of those things are trickling back into the community, but tangibly the economic impact that we've had in the city of Atlanta is over $5 million have been circulated in Atlanta by way of the company that I launched in 2016. And this is without any VC capital. Um, this is our, the blood, sweat and tears um, from my team and I and a community that rides with us so heavy. Um, we've been able to keep people employed during the pandemic. We've been able to help people launch businesses in the pandemic. And my village retail store, businesses, we opened our village retail store um, November of last year. No, yeah, November, uh, November of this year. Um, we, we opened, um, sorry, November of last year, we opened the village retail and businesses that's in my storefront at Pun City Market have grown from single figures to six figures in a shared retail store during a pandemic from single to six. That is putting you in a whole nother tax bracket. That is telling you that if you wanna quit this full-time job, you can uh, because you've been able to prove concept. And so those are some of the you know, things that we've been able we've been able to do, but what I'm most proud of is that we're not a company that has, I didn't create Village Market out of a reaction. I created Village Market proactively. There was no crisis happening in our country when I created the village. The only crisis to me that was happening at that time is that we were becoming disconnected with each other. And I think for black folks, we operate best when we are in close proximity to, to each other's gifts. So the only thing that was happening at that time in 2016, it's like, oh no, we're building a these silos and we need the tech stars of the world to be in, in the same room as, the, as these people that's creating products, as these people that's literally creating services. Let's pull us back together and not literally put ourselves on these islands of what we're doing in our, in our gifts. Mm. This is so beautiful people. I'm having a moment over here because I've said this on Twitter and, and, and I will continue to say this is as black people, we don't educate ourselves. We don't clothe ourselves. We don't feed ourselves and we don't house ourselves. The vast majority of us are dependent on everyone else to do for us. And when you look at the talent that we have, so those black people who are partners in certain law firm forms or on the partner track, those Black people <laughs> can work with other Black people to create Black businesses where we can employ each, employ each other and we don't have to have laws like the Crown Act, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. right? We don't wear, 
I'm just looking at it like you got to pass the law so I can wear the hair. I come out the root of my head, but to have those companies where we can just come to work as ourselves mm -hmm. because we are who we are and we, we are investing in each other. That is amazing. And that's what I want to see. And I'm hoping within the next couple of years, because I want to partner with some black people to build a, a black school in Mississippi. Wow. And one that's innovative. Wow. That's one that is really about levering, leveraging technology to reimagine what learning can be. Mm -hmm. And so that's what I want to do on a grander scale on entrepreneur side. So I'm hoping that that will be able to uh, see fruition. When you are in this space where you are now, and I saw you drop that essence earlier. I don't, you know, you know don't, don't think I ain't hear that people from Mississippi the essence but you're in a room now where your circle of black people is far different than the circle of black people you grew up with when you're in this in in, in these rooms and you're hearing and you're looking and you're speaking to other black people that have these huge dreams who have these bank accounts too and who have these visions what is that like in terms of motivation or self-assurance or even aspiring you to do even more? Hmm. That these questions today, Doc, you ain't hold anything back. Um, you know, the, the reality is uh, you're right. You know, my my life looks quite differently than the life I you know had growing up in Baseville, Mississippi and running in between cotton fields and Marks, Mississippi. I have my grandmother's house in Crowder, Mississippi, where my other grandmother uh, I've lived. And these are economically distressed places uh, in ways that's unimaginable, especially Crowder. Um, you know, but to be very honest with you, when I walk into these rooms, you know, with these celebrated folks or these high achieving black people, I carry the folks I grew up with, the people that raised me. Um, I carry my grandmother and my great grandmother. I carry my mother who's deceased, um, who only had a high school graduation. Um, I mean, a high school education. She dropped out when she was in 11th grade. I carry my dad. Um, the reason why I carry these people is because there's nothing about being in that room that I don't, I'm not clear that I add to the value in that room. And it's because of how I was raised, um, raised to kind of be so self-assured of who I am, to have a level of confidence and humility. I was raised to never bow my head. Um, and so when I walk in these rooms now, it is, there are moments though. Listen, there are some people I've met. I'm like, wow. Um, you know, what I've learned though, is that many black folks grew up all the same. So everybody is walking in that room, at least had had a moment that we're like, what kind of room and what is going on with my life right now? And when, when we see each other fully, there's a level of the way Black people share gaze that we just fully see each other. And it's like something that is so unspoken, but it's assuring that I see you, you see me, and let's shift the atmosphere in this space. And that's when I go into these to these spaces, uh, Doc. That is what I I strive to do. I strive to use whatever privileges that I have in my life now, especially those who are prepositioned with a great deal of capital. Those those fat bank accounts. That's not my life, y'all. Uh, but those that have it, I really use the light that I have to employ upon them. That when you do good, like literally when you've done well, do good with it. And so we can't forget. Like I can't forget where I grew up. These high achieving people at the same time can't forget where they grew up. And let's, how, how do we be like true that adage that we hear, you know, that a lift and tide lifts all boats. How do we actualize that with this privilege that we have that this prox proximity now to a different life than what we grew up? How do we start to literally take where we are and think about creating this modern village for real? And so I'm never, there are moments when, you know, in my in, inside internally, I'm like, I can't believe this is who I just met or this is who I just, you know, laugh with. Like we grew up as cousins. Um, I normally call my grandmother after those days because she loves to hear things like that. Um, but I but I always when I get off the call with her, I tell her, tell her thank you 
for teaching me young who I am and why I am because I don't shrink in those rooms. Um, I don't lose my Mississippi accent in those rooms. I'm so proud of it. I don't lose Tougaloo in those rooms. I'm so proud of it. It doesn't matter if I'm in a room with people that went to Harvard. I think Tougaloo is comparable and if not better. And I carry that and I walk in that. Um, so yeah, that that is how those rooms feel feel like to me. I, I feel like I make it brighter at that. I hear you, I hear you. And just the be here with you right now. And I, you know, I, I interviewed uh, Sheena on the show years ago. Girl, yeah. Right. And, and yeah. And to see how she went from doing these apps mm -hmm. to now having Capway. And I'm like, oh, this sister's about to just <laughs> do this online banking, black banking to the next level. I'm like, oh my gosh. I'm like, I am, I'm like, whoo. I'm, I'm loving what I am seeing right now. And, and what I'm hoping, and I love that the work that you're doing is that we've always had pockets yeah. of excellence, mm -hmm. but we need that to spill over to where we now have this, this network that is beyond Oh, okay, DC got some black people popping, or this place got some black people popping. We need that to go all over so that again we can work together. Uh Butch Graves once talked about how we need to scale together. How, mm -hmm. you know, if these two brothers got these two construction companies, but they're separate, they only can make so much money. Mm -hmm. But if when they merge, now those brothers can take government contracts. Now those brothers can build airports because they now have the capacity to take on billion dollar jobs and not million dollar jobs. And I'm thinking that's what we need to grow collectively and understanding that our, our power is always better together, mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. Always better together. So, I, to go there, I want to talk about something that I see on your website, uh, and it's all over what you do. Mm -hmm. Support is a verb. Mm -hmm. If you will, please expound on that. You know, I'm always challenging people to move beyond talking. Uh, you know, nothing, nothing shows up better than receipts. And so to me, support is a verb where I created that. You know, I was creating open and marketplaces. So if you're about it, you're going to physically show up and you're going to spend your dollars. Um, and this is one of the time I want you to tell people that you did it because that's going to make people come out to the next time and to the next time. And so any branding for entrepreneurs, um, for those who are thinking about entrepreneurship, you have to create a tagline that's true to what you do, uh, that's infectious and marketable, um, and it doesn't waver from however you may grow in the future. Support is a verb can grow wherever I go. Um, no matter what I open up, support as a verb fits there. Um, and so when I when I created that idea of like, hey, support is a verb, and I would say it to people, and they would be like, yeah, it is, it is, you know, you know, verb is an action. And so when I'm talking to allies, uh, when I'm talking to those who, you know, say that they're about black businesses, I always start lead the conversation, you know, Dr. Will, with what's your verb. What's your action from what we just talked about? Because if it's no action at the end, we wasted each other time. If it's no action in the end, we're not gonna see any economic mobility uh, for black folks. We're gonna see the growth of entrepreneur, black entrepreneurs hit a ceiling because the only way people grow is through that verb. Um, and for other entrepreneurs, you know, I do not believe that it's anybody's job to just quote unquote, support black. I don't believe that. I think everybody has a relation, a responsibility in a relationship. And so as we're, as I'm helping entrepreneurs build and scale, I ask them, what, what does your excellence look like? What is your customer service? What is your growth plan? Uh, you know, what is your prevention plan? What are all these things in place? Because if the verb is going to ha happen, if the people are going to come and the people are going to buy, then what is the verb in your business practices? You know, and how are you going to make sure that your company gets better and better and better? And so when I when I launched it, it I this is one of the things though, you know, I had no idea that support as a verb would take its own own life and and you know shape into this thing 
that, you know, a lot of my conversations or people see me now and be like, you know, you the support is a verb lady. I didn't, I didn't see that coming. I, I, I had no idea. I, I thank God for my English degree from Tougaloo. <laughs> yes, indeed. So we've talked a lot about the successes that you've had, and I am so, so happy and so proud of you for that. But what have been some of your setbacks and mm -hmm. What has been some of the greatest challenges that you've had to encounter thus far? Yeah, I think, you know, these learning moments uh, have been very humbling. Uh, you know, one of the biggest things, one of my biggest growth pains um, is not understanding that growth is so painful. You know, you say you want to hit these goals. You know, I want this, I want that. And every time you get to another stage, it's almost like starting over again because you have to build something new. And so the way that we accelerated in the last two years, nothing has set me on my butt the way that we that that this growth has done, that I've had to sit back and literally exhale and, and study more, study deeper, uh, more deeply. I've had to hire more talent and that's hard because an, another area of that growth is having to bring even more people you know, into the fold. And that is a challenge if you don't have a good process in place. Uh, but, you know, the, the things that I think about most, like what was hard for me is knowing that some of the, you know, understanding that some of the people that helped me build the, the village initially were not the people that were supposed to stay and kind of help me grow it to where it is today. That was hard. Um, that still is hard. And so those who champion that and, and figure that out, you know, I, God bless you. That's still hard for me. Um, other things, you know, as you grow in your business, reach a certain scale, the way your tax life is set up, it's different. And so you have to, un you, there's no, you, there's a day that you have a bookkeeper. There's a day that you have a CPA and there's a day that you have a CFO. Um, and every person is necessary on the journey. And to understanding like what growth means and what comes with that growth, what comes with all these accomplishments. I think that has been the, you know, believe it or not, has been some of the hardest, most challenging moments in learning how to balance not working 15, 16 hours a day. It is quite natural once you open your own thing that you don't think about the hours that you spend doing it. You just go and go and go and go. And I, I uh, almost hit a, a level of burnout. Um, a couple of years ago because I was going too much and I was trying to build, I wasn't resting. Even when I closed my eyes, the business was like circulating in my mind. And I, I, I found myself, you know, just being so tired. Um, and I've, the more I talk with entrepreneurs, I really challenge them to make sure that they take time for rest. Doesn't matter how great these businesses are, if we're not well. Um, and so those have been a, those been a tough, tough moments. And growth pains, there's, there's <laughs> no one warns you that when you start, you know, crushing your goals, that it's a, it, it is so hard to be in this very new space as well. Mm. And I loved how you, you dropped that free game on that money because when I started consulting, I knew I couldn't go to H&R Block. <laughs> <laughs> Rudd had to go ahead and get him a CPA uh, because it, it was it was okay this real because Uncle Sam gonna get their money and I knew that I was gonna have to pay Uncle Sam as well but the, the question is the CPA knows the deductions that uh, limit my liability uh, which is what I wanted uh, because right. it was crazy that what I was told, had you not done these, what you'd been paying, I was like, oh, well, thank you uh, for that. So, and that's one of those things to where for that educator who gets into this game, I don't know if they even think about it because once you start, because most of us either, we, you know, as an educator, you write a book or you start consulting or you sell a course or you sell curriculum. And when you're out there consulting, that check that school district gives you looks nice. Mm -hmm. But you get that check, but they take nothing out of that check. Right? So you're like, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. 
but uh you got to file those taxes on that money that you made and uncle, again uncle sam mm-hmm. uncle sam ain't playing even last time my wife and i the crazy thing about it we went wife logged in to say can we get a payment plan and the government said your bill is due here <laughs> Well, no payment plan in there. We just, okay, let's just write this check. I was like, okay. I was like, no payment plan for you. Uh, so from Mississippi to Atlanta, Atlanta's popping. I don't like Atlanta traffic. Mm-hmm. It is terrible for me as a Mississippian. Mm-hmm. But what is that landscape like in Atlanta? Because I've had some people on the show like Coriel, who's from mm-hmm. Atlanta, Precious Price from Atlanta doing it over there. See, hey, I'm telling you, I'm be bringing these black entrepreneurs on here. And Atlanta just seems just like, not only with those HBCU, the powerhouse HBUs they have there, but the fact that all of this black genius is over there making this money and bringing entrepreneurship to the next level. What is it like living in Atlanta with all of that around you? Uh, you know, Atlanta is probably one of the most special places in the world. Uh, I think there is there's something so special and nostalgic about this city because I believe the way that I've been able to grow and accelerate is because this is where I landed. Uh, I think Atlanta is a city where you can you you can have an idea, and that idea doesn't just grow it blossoms and you have to catch up with it sometimes and I think only a few cities can do that and I think you know Atlanta is is that for me is that for a number of my friends the uh, people that you name like Coriel uh, people that you've had on like Sheena uh, Dr. Nashley and what she's building you know in, in Jackson Mississippi very soon all of us landed in in Atlanta and I think Atlanta just is a city that your blackness is welcome and encouraged. And if you do the necessary work, you're gonna find even more like minds. Sheena and I didn't know each other in Mississippi and we knew each other in Atlanta because our work literally began to collide. And folks were like, y'all need to know each other. Dr. Nashley, Coriel, Jewel Burks, Ryan Wilson, these people who are doing extraordinary things here our work is what put us in the same room together. And I think that when we describe what Atlanta is, that is what Atlanta is. That is you grow, you blossom, you meet other people that's growing and blossoming. Um, but there's another thing, you know, that's also true about Atlanta. And I'm and I believe in telling, you know, two things can be true at the same time. As incredible as this city is, and this city now is, you know, home to me. And no matter where I go in, in, in the world, I'm going to always have a house in Atlanta. That's how much I love it here. Um, but at the same time, Atlanta is a city that has its inequities, no different than the Mississippi Delta. That the, the city, this wealth gap here is per, more pervasive than anywhere else in this country. Um, the clear distinction between those that have and those that, not, that do not have is so potent that you can have seven figure people living within a mile radius of people who literally have an income of 11,000 per year. And they both black and they both in the same city. And so if we don't talk about that thing in a city that I love so much in a city that I believe is the only city in this country that is poised to be the black Mecca, then we won't push Atlanta to become that black Mecca. But there's no other place I'd rather build. There's no other place that I've, I've, I don't ever feel with the exception of being at Tougaloo, I've ever feel that who I am for who, for who I am and what I am has ever been so well received. I'm so grateful that this is the place that I was meant to grow at, grow into my grown womanhood. Um, I'm so grateful that this is the place that I can like be so proud to say like my company is headquartered in, in, in Atlanta, Georgia, and that a lot of these people that you just named here, we all decided to be in this city together. And now we're in the same space together and we're figuring out how to partner together. That's what, that's what Atlanta is for me and, and, and so many other folks. Boy, getting me going to go to Atlanta. 
It's amazing. It's, it's a good time. It's, it's some good people here. That, that dog on traffic though, man. I've been in Atlanta and I'm like, <laughs> I'm like, oh my gosh. I mean, it was, oh, my worst experience is I'm coming off this ramp mm -hmm. <laughs> and this traffic over here, no, we coming, but they ain't moving to let me in. And then the people behind me are like, uh, uh, uh. I'm like, look, man, I'm from Mississippi now. The, 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 the worst traffic I know is Jackson. That's it. <laughs> That's all I Y'all Jackson traffic will be celebrated, you know, you celebrated here. I will say I agree with you. Atlanta traffic, I had to get used to. And also what you just described are these aggressive drivers that if you stall a little bit, you know you're about to get the horn treatment. Uh, and you see people speed up to not let you in, though we both want to be stuck in the same place for at least 30 minutes together. Now I'm just behind you rather than in front of you. Uh, but we're going to make it the same destination at, at the same time. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. But we need to go back. We need to go back. I did enjoy. I've been there a couple of times. Uh, one was a business trip. Another one was recruit. I went to ISTE, which is one of the largest ed tech confer conferences in the world in Atlanta. And it was nice. Uh, the Hilton was lovely, though. When I walked out the Hilton, I saw the sign. Uh, for an advertisement for another thing that Atlanta is uh, popular and known for that I shall not shall not mention on this show. <laughs> but you laugh, so you know exactly what I'm talking about. I know about. exactly what you're talking about. <laughs> I was like, wow, this sign is right outside of this posh Hilton right here. <laughs> okay, I guess you're trying to catch the businessman coming out the door. But I was That's like, cool. okay, okay. Uh, so... Before we go, this has been such an awesome conversation, Doc. Thank you so much for coming on. Oh no, this has been this has been incredible. Uh, I was so excited to talk to you, and you know now I understand why. But when you know when we got connected by way of Twitter, I was able to look at your work um, and laugh at some of your podcasts. You're just doing this work very well, and I'm I'm so happy that you're opening this conversation to folks like me, but also educators who was just like me. Um, to think about there's a life that you can live in, in the classroom, there's a life that you can live in leadership, but no matter what that is, no matter how purposeful, there's a cap on how far you can economically grow in it. And so you can love this thing, you can stay in this thing, but that other, those other streams of revenue, and this is for anyone, multiple streams of revenue is how we began to create generational wealth. And so I'm happy that you're talking about it and, and bringing folks on um, to really encourage those to know like, hey, you can do both. Um, and then you can add something else on as well. Yes, ma'am. Alhamdulillah. And thank you so much for listening. Um, you know, I just say hey, it, it, this economic journey has been a journey for us, for, for the wife and I, because there was a time earlier on in our marriage where we were straight struggling and got to a point to where you start getting them phone calls, you start getting them letters. And it was literally my wife at first was just like, look, okay, okay, we're not, we're not dodging, dodging nothing else. And so she just called up those people and she's okay, we're gonna work this out, blah, blah, blah. And we just started paying people off one by one, paying people off one by one. And then the consulting, the writing started happening, bringing all this extra income and then watching how we spent that money, right? And then started doing, I said, so you saw the credit score go from the six something to the seven something something. I ain't give y'all my exact credit score now, people, but understand <laughs> your, your boy doing all right right now. But when you see all that happening and then you see the money stacking mm -hmm. in the bank account and you go, man, I ain't going back. Mm -hmm. I can't go back. I can't go back. And, and just to feel comfortable to know that if something happened and I needed to write that $5,000 check, I can write that $5,000 check. Mm -hmm. I don't want to, <laughs> but, <Right>. knowing, <laughs> but knowing that I could comfortably do that, that brings me peace, mm -hmm. right? Cause I'm not wondering, oh, where, where is that money gonna come from? Do I need to go borrow this? Do I need to go borrow that? And so being on an economic journey from watching, you know, uh, YouTube videos and hearing different Black people speak about economics. And, and I'm like, yo, this is where I'm trying to go mm -hmm. because I'm trying to build something 
to where not only am I comfortable, but I want to be able to write that check to my mama if she called me and say something happened and I need this. I don't want her to even be concerned that the check too big, that the number too big. I want to know that I got it. And so mm-hmm. that's one of the motivating factors of me uh, doing what I do yeah. to make sure that everything, everything is locked down, we're taken care of. Uh, before we go, what is your advice to that educator th- th- who they're thinking about what they're doing and they want to create a business that's centered around education, but they don't know where to start. They don't know where to begin. And they get overwhelmed by the idea of creating a business. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. And so, you know, that anxiety that comes, uh, that paralyzes so many folks. Um, when your ideas begin to scare you, you know, first I want to say and tell you how normal that is. Um, because if we normal thing, then you understand that a lot of people who you're celebrating now had the same thing. And then they decided to move forward. Um, For educators, uh, people I love, you start with what you're good at. So if it's tutoring, get you a group of folks and tutor them, because those are your first clients. And what happens when you don't call it a business at first, you get to practice at it. Mm -hmm. Um, And as you begin to practice, not just your acumen improves, but your confidence in what you're being able to do. Because successful folks are not the smartest people in the room. It's those that's confident to put themselves out there. And so if you have to grow incrementally, grow incrementally, but you have to have a target audience first. Who is your first audience? Tap into that. Write down what you learned. Write down if you started with five, then what's the goal to get to 15? The day that you hit 15, write what you learned, what stressed you a little bit. And when you get to 15, then what it looks like to get to 50, we're gonna make a big jump. Write down what you learned. And as you're writing down or using something like rev.com, rev.com to literally talk about your journey, you're gonna look up and you're gonna have a business plan ready. And other than that, you're gonna have receipts to show you that you are beyond worthy, but you're already doing the thing that you're scared to call it a business. The only thing you have to do after that is put a stamp on it and call it a business. Go ahead and get your entity, get registered. Make sure you go ahead and get your landing page because you don't want someone to steal this brilliant idea that you have this business name. Go ahead and get that unlocked and then get you some trusted friends who, who love you enough to be honest with you to help you begin to build what is going to be your part of your liberation. But start small, start incrementally, and understand that in the end of that, this first idea may not be the best idea. That's the idea that would get you going to have the confidence, the ecosystem, the target, understanding the business, to be able to fully grow into whatever that next thing is for you. And when you get there though, And this is not just for entrepreneurs in education. This is what I tell every one of us who've had the vision and doing it and can sit now and write big checks like Dr. Will. There has to be a collective consciousness that comes with success. Only in our collective consciousness can we really live what liberation is. So from the point of where you start, the North Star has to be How do we collectively build something that many of us have never experienced before together? And let's go get it. Let's operate in black excellence and then some. Let's be humble. Let's build people on, bring people on our teams. Let's forgive folks when we need to. Let's let people go when we need to. But more importantly, understanding the assignment to have a vision is one of the greatest honors that God could give any of us. That's how you end the show. Uh, <laughs> Doc, thank you so much for coming on. Uh, thank you so much, Dr. Will. It's been an absolute, absolute pleasure. I cannot wait till you come to Atlanta and sit in traffic. Then you and your wife come by and see me. <laughs> we'll, we'll do, we'll do. Now, people, you know how I do this. This episode is going to be on Apple Podcasts, Google Podcasts, 
iHeartRadio, Simplecast, Stitcher, Spotify, and Audible. I need you to subscribe and follow and share. And though I am on all major podcast platforms, I'm trying to grow on Apple Podcasts. So I need you to subscribe and I need you to listen to it, people, and give me some reviews because I'm trying to be found and I'm trying to get Oprah on the show because I want to <laughs> know that I'm doing big things around here. Again, I'd like to thank my guest, Dr. Key Hallman for coming on and dropping so many gems. Yo, this episode is coming out real fast. And I'd like to thank y'all again for checking out another episode of the Dr. Will Show, the mobile university for entrepreneurs. As always, people, invest in you. EDU, peace. <laughs>